this is my setup here and uh, spine tester sander bandsaw and I'm working on a northern um, eastern woodlands arrow made of hickory I'll take all the measurements when I go inside the weight and the different diameters along the shaft it's tapered by eye right now I just tapered it and it's spined right now to 65 pounds all right originally this was a stave for a bow but I cut it into four parts so I can make four arrows and what I do is I just sand it on the sander or I trim it on the bandsaw first I'm sorry trim it on the bandsaw first and take it to the sander to get it round and then once it's about three-eighths I guess three-eighths in diameter I come over to the spine tester spine it and at three-eighths it was close to a hundred pounds of spine so I just keep going back and forth I don't know what the diameter is right now in the middle but I'll, I'll take that measurement inside but I just sand it spine it sand it you know and spin it taper it by eye until I get the right spine okay I left the knock a little bit larger because they are supposed to be bulbous on most of these arrows and I drilled a whole quarter inch on the tip to accept different tips and uh, I'll give you an idea what those look like this here this is a white tail antler and this is a hafted arrowhead but it's just hafted for the video there's no glue anyway to give you the idea of how much these weigh sixty four grains sixty four grains All right, and as you can see the antler is a lot more dense and a lot heavier than this uh, arrowhead and foreshaft combination All right, it's kinda of hard to believe but the antler is quite heavy so uh, another thing I was gonna do was I was gonna make a spine tester with uh, calipers and I found that the calipers actually have a resistance to the slide so it, it's not going to give me a, a good uh, accurate reading on the deflection if there's some resistance there okay and I guess we can see how much it is that's ounces there if I put this on here and slide it There's at least five ounces of resistance to the slide. And that that won't that means you won't get an accurate reading. So I'm gonna try something different. Uh, this is my old spine tester. I want to replace it with something more compact. I don't like this big dial here, and I want to be able to carry this in a pouch or something. Alright, so I'm gonna go inside and finish all these measurements I need to take on on this stuff so you guys can see all right all right I took some measurements and marked up the arrow shaft the diameter here at the base is 13 30 seconds and then at one inch it's 5 16 or 8 millimeters and then every four inches I take another measurement or 10.2 centimeters Five sixteenths or eight millimeters, eleven thirty seconds, eleven thirty seconds, eleven thirty seconds, three eighths, three eighths, fifteen thirty seconds, eleven sixteenths, and the final diameter seven eighths. All right. Not sure I mentioned this already. Uh, 34 and a half inches long. 1,006 1, grains or 652 grams. 
and the final diameter 7 8 okay I also drilled a hole in here quarter inch diameter uh, slightly tapered I just wobbled the drill bit in there okay now it's spined for 65 pounds now uh, it's really dry here in West Texas so if you do the same measurements as this and if you live in a humid area you're probably going to spine less like around 60 pounds or maybe even 55 okay so this is 65 pounds for me but it might not be 65 pounds for you and this is well seasoned very dry wood it's been drying in my shop for at least three years okay so be careful when you use these measurements these are just a guide they may not give you a 65 pound spine it might give you a much less of a spine with hickory and I don't know what type hickory this is it's probably uh, pig nut hickory since it was harvested in the south I, I believe it was Florida so my bet would be pig nut hickory for this I know it's not shag bark okay so keep that in mind pig nut is one of the hardest and densest hickories okay now as far as the uh, bits or the tips this hole is drilled one inch deep exactly and this quarter inch this is a quarter inch dowel I use for the foreshaft okay so I got some measurements on this uh, foreshaft total length four and a half four and one quarter inches uh, the arrowhead itself is one and five eighths long by thirteen sixteenths wide again quarter inch diameter uh, dowel made of birch total length of everything is five and a half inches and again one inch depth for the hole and this type of wrapping is what I think was very common in the northeast in the woodlands area for this type of arrowhead this simple triangular uh, Madison or maybe even um, I can't think of the other name right now Fort Ancient but uh, for sure Madison Point okay this uh, piece of deer antler is two and seven eighths inches long again quarter inch diameter here down at the base it's tapered at the tip okay got some other stuff down here I prefer to use this type of arrow straightener and I've had questions on why I use this this type for my arrows when you could just use this type just as easily well this is fine as long as the diameter is not too large but this of course won't fit in there uh, it doesn't fit here either but I can insert this end of the shaft much easier you know and quicker with this type of tool than I can with a tool that's, that's got a fixed hole unless I make the hole large enough for this which is pretty big but it, you know it's possible of course anyway that's a side note uh, another side note is uh, these things here you can get these at Walmart that's where I got this it's for uh, grinding uh, food I tried using this as a hammer stone it did not work very well <laughs> probably better as an abrader but I've heated you know I put some coals in here before and I've heated wood over it and it hasn't broken on me so I, can, I think it stands up to heat pretty well anyway that was pretty cool all right the uh, reference I use is this book here <clears throat> and this arrow is a little bit longer than average but the as far as the, the the size of this heavy part it's about average but I made it extra long on purpose just in case I messed up on it all right it's uh, the encyclopedia of Native American bows arrows and quivers and this one is volume one it doesn't say there but it says here 
volume one. Okay. Now I got some places bookmarked. But there's quite a few of these arrows in here that are that bulbous tips from all sorts of different cultures. Alright? So I took inspiration from those. There's some in here that have tips inserted and some don't. But that one's just a self arrow. Most of these are self arrows. But this one's a composite arrow and it has a piece of bone stuck in the tip. Another self arrow with a bulbous tip. And the knocks are usually bulbous also. one that has like an extra piece of wood sticking out there. This is my favorite. I like this one here. I don't have, I didn't have time yesterday to do that one, but I'd like to do one like that eventually. Menominee. And the length is like 27 and a half. These are much shorter than mine. Alright. There's a bunch more in here. These are pretty cool here. Algonquin. I think I'm going to make this type of knock here on this one. Well, I'll look around and I'll see. I'll get. A, I'll make like an average type of knock. My tip is about in line with this one here. This one's a little bit larger. These are larger than mine, but they're also shorter, so they're not going to be a thousand grains like my arrow probably. All right, so I'm going to make more than these two videos in this series. I'm going to make some more uh, tips. Uh, this is just two that I came up with really quick. I'm going to make some fishing tips and uh, see how that works. Because I think you can use this style with, you know, just by itself with no tip. You can also insert tips or you can also use it for fishing because it's pretty easy to wrap a string around here it won't come off this way and attach the string to the uh, fore shaft okay it's like a harpoon almost and uh, harpoon the fish with it and this will come out and the fish will thrash around and you'll be able to pull it in without breaking your arrow okay now I've had a hard time straightening this. It keeps getting unstraightened every night, so <laughs> I guess that's the nature of hickory. All right, that's it. Okay, I'm doing some research in my shop, and uh, I came across this picture. I remembered I had this picture from a long time ago, uh, and I was doing some research on whether or not these bulbous tipped arrows had fletchings, and these do here, and this is the only picture I have of an Indian shooting into the air using these uh, to shoot birds. Now, in this book here, they are called bird bolts, these bulbous tipped arrows. Uh, bows, arrows, and quivers of the American frontier by John Baldwin. Uh, this book is expensive. I bought it uh, maybe five years ago six years ago for seventy five dollars it's up to hundred and fifty dollars now as far as I can tell so they are getting expensive um, let's see okay so I wanted to see the length this is like the longest I've seen these arrows with the bulbous tip or what they call uh, bird bolts okay uh, now they don't give measurements on the arrows but they do give the measurement on the bow and this is Chief Jim Crow, and he's either a Seneca or a Menominee Indian chief. Uh, I've seen different accounts. Uh, but in this book, uh, what's important here for this study is the, the length of the bow, and I'm going to compare it to the length of the arrow. The length of the bow is 66 inches, so I measured it with a string. 
All right? Got the length and uh, measured the uh, string, and then used calipers to measure this arrow. Okay, because this is a very clear picture of the arrow. Should be straight on. Everything looks like it's straight on with no distortion on the photograph. So, the string turned out to be 89 millimeters, which is equal to 66 inches, and the arrow on the calipers was 53 millimeters, so I I did a conversion here, uh, 66 divided by 89, that's 74, 0.74 conversion factor, so 0.74 times 53 millimeters comes out to 39.3 inches, or 100 centimeters. Okay, now I wrote that down, that's the longest I've ever seen one of these bird bolts. So 39.3 is very close to 39 and a quarter. Now the shortest I've seen is 23 inches in this book here. In the previous book that I showed in the other video. And I measured, uh, I, in this front section of the Northeast it has several of these bird bolts. And I wrote them all down, took an average and I got 26 inches average. Okay, so the range is 23 inches to 39 with an average of 26. Okay, so so far that's what I've gotten on that. Now getting back to this book here, uh, these are fletched, these long arrows, but some of these are not. Okay, and there's a section in here Hopefully I can get this without glare. There's a section in this book that uh, gives more detail on these what they call bird bolts. Okay, here's a photograph showing a bird bolt and a bow together. Now, unfortunately, I can't see the fletching on that arrow in the photograph. It may or may not have fletching, but on these down here, some of them do have fletching and some don't. Okay, now this one here on the far right doesn't have any fletching, the other ones do. So they vary, some have fletching, some don't. Now, you know, trying to get rid of the glare. Okay, these here are these up here. So let me give you a close-up view of the carving. You know, some some of them are angled abruptly, some of them are tapered gradually. Okay, so those are these down here. Uh, some of these have signs of fletching. These were fletched. I don't know about these. And I think this collection here are these up here. Okay. Now I'm not sure we don't have a larger picture of these. The interesting thing about these is that one up on top actually has the bottom a stem of a stone arrowhead in there all right and there's a little bit of sinew wrapping left over but there's a broken arrowhead on that one okay but I'm assuming that these are all bulbous tipped and that's not flat um, if you know what I mean it's got an abrupt transition between the arrowhead and the uh, wood I'm assuming on that one which would happen you know if you have a bulbous tip and these are all uh, tapered gradually semi gradually kind of like mine now mine's 34 and a half inches long so it's within the range it's on the little bit above average of course well maybe not a little bit but it's above average or longer than average I should say all right so that's that um, this one here is the longest one they studied of course they don't show the whole arrow but it, that one is 
31 and 7 8 inches long. Okay. And I wish I could go through and, you know, scan through the whole book and show you each picture by picture. But I'd probably get in trouble. <laughs> okay, so uh, I will do another video on this. I just wanted to get that out of the way. these there's a couple more interesting things like this one here see the uh, arrowhead I think this transition is not abrupt I think this is flattened okay but the big the large arrowhead here and a large arrowhead there uh, makes me think about um, this is unusual right it makes me Think about the size of the arrowheads that were actually being used during this time. Uh, we think of mostly bird points at this time, but they may have been using these larger arrowheads for their arrows. Okay, shot from bows. That's what makes it different from an atlatl dart. Okay, so then we got some over here, 31 inches. These are more narrow, I don't think I showed these 24 and 7 eighths much more narrow than mine bottom, no fletching I don't know if I showed these before they have the carved tips again, no signs of fletching and again, another large arrowhead stone, this one is slate, I believe and I think that's just an interpretation here. Just, they don't have an actual arrow attached to this one. They just have the arrowhead. Okay. And then this here, this interesting one here. Again, no fletching. Where they have these bone tips inserted. And these are quite wide. Much wider than mine. And that one is 24 and a half. But this, the weight on this end is going to be a lot. Uh, these ends have been constricted. Let's see. Okay, these are split timber, so they are not hardwood. In this book, when it says split timber, it's some sort of softwood. And these knocks are flattened. It's uh, when you when I see these flattened knocks, uh, they're a very northern tribe trait. So these are probably made of pine or fir. So they're not going to be that heavy, but it's of course much heavier than let's say 240 grains. But I'll, maybe I'll make one of these and 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 weigh it so we can see. Some more here. This one actually has bone. Another northern arrow. It has a bone blunt attached, and this one has no length on it, but I believe all these shafts are softwood or timber, what they call timber, split conifer. Split timber again, and these have fletching, these have fletching. These are split hardwood, Seneca. Like the, uh, I guess the picture we saw over here. It's a Seneca bow. This Seneca, let's see, is that, yeah, these are elaborate. Okay, so without showing you the whole thing. There's another one here, 27. This one has some large eastern woodland style fletching and it kind of gives you a detail of what they look like. I'm probably going to put this type of fletching on my arrow. And I'll show you how I do that. Another These have fletching. These have grooved, carved, 
carved grooves. 20, this is 28 and a half, 30. Now these, I think, I think I have some of those, or let's see, I think one of those was shown in this book, in the uh, John Baldwin book. No, maybe not. Okay, well, I'll I'll get back to this and do a new video do a new video when I've got some more research. All right. All right, so this is my progress so far on the arrow. And I put some glue on here, some pitch glue. And this is a different arrowhead and a different foreshaft than the other one. Uh, I misplaced the original combination, but but that's okay. I wanted to make this thicker up in this area anyway. And uh, I fitted it into the uh, the hole here. Now the only concern I have about this being authentic, or this being a possibility of being used in the past, is that if I actually shot this at something, it would probably snap right here at the joint. And this foreshaft would snap off. And I was thinking about that. Um, but if maybe if uh, this was used as a war arrow, it wouldn't be a disadvantage because if you shot it at an enemy and it broke right there, you couldn't shoot the arrow back. It would just be shot back as a blunt. And if this comes out, same thing. This stays in the wound and uh, they can only shoot back a blunt, which wouldn't be useful, of course. So maybe it could be used as a war arrow. So I'm going to leave it. Um, I like to scrape away. Sometimes I did it this time. I don't always do it, but uh, I, I kind of left the wood thick. So I scraped away some glue from the wood here to make it, you know, uh, skinnier here for the transition. It it also helps the sinew to stick to the wood itself. Although it would stick, you know, with the glue with the hot melt also. So it doesn't really matter. But I just shaved it off there so it would be thinner. Okay, and uh, I carved on the bandsaw a groove in here to wrap with sinew to strengthen this so it won't split, so that it won't split across. And I finished out the knock. And I've got a, got a reference here that I used. Let's see if I can do this. My shop is kind of small and the arrow is kind of long. I went by this arrow here, Seneca arrow. Mine's a little bit different, of course. I didn't try to get it exact. Mine's a little bit bigger. The notch, or the knock is deeper. And the arrow itself is thicker. This is life size here. So my arrow diameter is thicker everything is pretty much longer and uh, heavier than the arrow in the book okay and my setup here I like to use I've just bought this recently is a, a small skillet I think that cost me like fifteen dollars and that's the pitch glue in there and I just turn it up maybe three quarters of the way I'm not sure what the temperature setting is on that but it seems to work pretty good. And then I use water on my fingers to keep the glue from sticking to my fingers. But I, I just take the four shaft. And when this is all melted, I just dip it in there. I got one side elevated so all the glue pools into the front. And I just dip, you know, I dip the other end in. And then uh, I use the water on my fingers to keep the glue from sticking. And I just push it in push it around. I trim off, after it's hardened a little bit or cooled down a little bit, I trim off the extra. I also sand away some of that to make it flatter and push it down. So when I wrap it with sinew, it's all flush and there's no gaps under the sinew. It's got a translucency too, also a little bit. Anyway, 
that's my progress so far. Alright. Alright, so I did a little more work on the arrow and I painted some of it. Painted it uh, near the front with some designs, a few designs. Now, uh, I put some Sinnoh here in this uh, channel that I carved out. You can see it's kind of shrunk in a little bit if I can get it to focus. So I think I'm going to wrap some more sinew in there and make it flush. Uh, I, I took this design from one in the book. You can see there. It's fairly simple. Uh, I was kind of worried about the uh, semicirculars and semicircles not matching up you know these rounded lines but I got lucky they matched up okay but that's where I got that and that's where I also got these uh, bands here except mine are a little bit different brown and black there and I stained stained this area here a little bit with uh, red pigment and I'll show you that in a minute. The uh, I haven't fletched these yet because I'm I'm looking at different fletchings. I haven't decided whether or not I'm going to fletch it like this, the normal, well, the most common way that I've seen, or with the uh, eastern fletch this way. Or, or these on here. These are basically the same arrows, I mean the same design on the knock between the Seneca and the Algonquin here. Looks very, very similar to mine. Okay. Um, I have done some Eastern two flex bef two fletch before. So I'll just show you those. Now this one, uh, I didn't bend them over like I did on this one here. These are bent over, you know, like I wrap them when they're extended, you know, down this way. I put the feathers down this way and wrap them and then fold them over forward, as you can probably tell. And then you finish the wrapping in the front. So the first stage is to do the wrapping in the back and then do the and then finish up with the front. All right. So I have done those. I'm leaning toward that. Uh, I got two different types of feathers. The, these are pheasant wing, male pheasant wing pointers, and I have some duck pointers as well. Not sure which I'll use yet, but uh, I'm going to make two arrows, so I guess I'll use one. Um, use these on one arrow and these on the other. Now, if it's a two fletch, eastern two fletch, I'm only going to use two feathers, obviously. <clears throat> but if I do the three fletch, I'll use all three. That's why I've got three three of each. Okay. Now, I did wrap the arrowhead with sinew. See if we can get a better view above and below. I coated this area down here. I haven't burnished it yet, but I'm going to burnish it in, a little, in uh, probably tomorrow. I can't do it tonight. I was going to say in a cup in, uh, in a little while, but I'm, I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> it's getting late. Let's see here. Um, I used the Sharpies here. I cheated and used Sharpies for this design here. The black on the outside, the brown on the inside. Now, the uh, this stain here was made with uh, iron oxide powder and duck fat. And believe it or not, I bought this at the grocery store. It was in the fridge just now. That's why it looks kind of uh, whitish. If you let it sit outside and, and warm up, it becomes very clear on the top with only a little bit of white at the bottom. 
uh, like this here. This is what the duck fat looks like when it's warm. So I just mix it with some iron oxide powder and uh, wipe it on like a stain and wipe off the excess and it works pretty good. Okay, so there's that. The uh, This is the sinew I used. This is uh, backstrap sinew. It's kind of a lower grade because it's it, it's kind of greasy. I mean, it's it, it's they're long pieces, but I've got two different grades. I've got some that it, don't have any oil or grease on them that I use for bow strings, but these the lower grade and these are a little bit older too. I use for wrappings because it's not as strong as the higher grade that doesn't have any grease on it. So the weaker sinew I use for the wrappings. And the glue, I made some um, high glue. Now this is gelled. It was warmed up earlier, but it's it's gelled. And all it is is uh, Nox gelatin. So I just boil some water in this. I stick it in the microwave for about a minute, maybe less, maybe 45 seconds, like an eighth of a cup of water. It boils pretty fast, and then I add the uh, the Nox gelatin in there, mix it up and uh, it makes a very effective glue and I'm gonna put both of these back in the refrigerator and keep in there uh, this fat should last for at least a year this I don't know how long actually I might just dry this in the dehydrator to a solid block and I'll just wet it as I need it okay that's my progress so far Okay, I just wanted to show you a little bit of what I do. Now, this is an arrow. It's going to be an arrow, but uh, it's too narrow here for the bulbous tip on the other one. Uh, the first one I made has a, a, a wider bulbous tip, so I've got I've got some other pieces from that stave that'll work. I hope that'll hope that's wide enough. Anyway, this one probably is because it's fatter right here. But anyway, I wanted to show you what I do. Now, I could probably build a shaving horse and use a draw knife and make quick work out of this, but I, I tend to use the same tools. I mean, I tend to use simple tools and the same tools for everything, for bow making and arrow making. Uh, I try to get as simple as possible. This is a, actually a throwing knife, but I liked it because it's a quarter inch thick. It's nice and heavy. It can be used... Uh, to uh, to shape wood with small cuts or I can split wood by hammering on it like a fro I guess they're called and it'll split wood that way it's strong enough for you to hammer on top anyway hickory has uh, the advantage of splitting along the grain okay and as you can see it's curved I'm following the grain and what I do for an arrow is I get it down to where I can't really shape it very well with this because it it uh, it flexes a little bit too much when it gets thin like this uh, but before I go any further I straighten it at this stage 
you know, I follow the grain and then I'll, I'll sit over here with the fire and I'll straighten it out before I work it on the sander. Okay, but like I said, this one is just uh, too small and I was just kind of shaving it down for the video. I'm going to do these other two, but I'm going to do the moth video so I don't mess them up. <laughs> but uh, again, I, this is not difficult to straighten. Straightens pretty easy on the fire. Okay, that's it. Okay, just to show you how I straighten this, uh, I've got a tool here I made. I call this my bow wrench. So I use it for bow making too. Anyway, what I do is warm this up on the fire. Uh, it takes too long to demonstrate right now, but I'm just going to show you uh, basically what I do. I don't. I try not to scorch the wood. I just warm it up evenly, and I tend to warm up a large area. I like to work over a large area, so I'll sit here for I don't know 10 minutes and warm it up. And then I'll come over here. And I'll use the bow wrench and I'll straighten it like this. All right, and I'll just work it as straight as possible. All right. I don't know if you can see, but this fire is built on a stump, uh, like one of these back here. But this is a big stump, and I, I like building a fire on something like this because I can put items on the stump, uh, as long as it's not too big. I can put items on here and keep them off the ground and keep everything off the ground. I uh, just wanted to mention that real quick. All right, so before it gets too dark, this is preliminary straightened. This is the preliminary straightening, okay? So what I'll do now is I'll continue shaving it. I'll switch to a knife and I'll shave it down with the knife and try to follow the grain as much as possible. Well, I'll try to follow the grain exactly if I can. Now when you're bending it, uh, if you're not following the grain and you, and you end up bending it uh, too much, it'll tell you because these splinters will pop up. Okay, It doesn't matter too much when it's still thick, but when you've got it really thin, you don't want those splinters popping up. I had one pop up, I think, over here somewhere. So I know I was getting a little bit too narrow there. So that's the only thing I've got to be careful of when I'm doing this. I've got to be very careful of how I cut into this. And I heat the, uh, the compression side, which means, let's say it's, it's uh, curving upward like this. I'll heat this bottom side and I'll, you know, compress that side. It'll be the side that I'm compressing when I'm straightening, when I'm straightening. So my rule of on straightening anything is to heat the compression side when you're, when you're trying to straighten it. Uh, some people will roll it all the way around but I don't do that. Only the, I only heat the compression side or the side that's, you know, convex. And then when I'm straightening it, it's actually in compression. Okay, so I only heat the compression side, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay, I'm going to show you how I trim these feathers for the Eastern Two Fletch. And this is a duck feather domesticated duck. It's not a wild duck. And these are these are pretty cheap. You can get these in different places. Sometimes they sell them at uh, Michael's or other hobby places like Hobby Lobby and I think they also sell duck feathers at Walmart but usually they're not this nice. So I order these online. Okay, now I could trim this with a razor blade or something, but I, I tend to 
use the uh, Dremel tool these days. Okay, so the Dremel tool allows me to keep it uh, straight and to uh, sand it straight so it'll, it'll lay flat on the arrow. It doesn't lay flat here, but it, it, it's important in this area to lay flat on the shaft. So the Dremel tool comes in handy for that. Otherwise it would take me a long time to sand it by hand and to cut it by hand with a razor blade or a sharp rock anyway that's what it looks like before I mount it on the arrow and I soak it in water before I I put it on the arrow okay so this is the finished fletching on the on the arrow that I'm working on okay now I'll show it in a different video how I do this on the next arrow but uh, I'm gonna cut this one short I don't have much time tonight but you can see part of that arrow inside the wrapping inside the sinew wrapping so it starts down here you know it starts in this position down here and then I uh, I fold it forward after I wrap it and then I put it like a quarter twist in the feather and then finish the wrapping up here again I soak the arrow the uh, feather before I do this to make it uh, pliable here where I bend it otherwise it'll just snap off okay and then when it's all uh, all um, humid and has soaked up water uh, when I stretch it out and tie it, it shrinks and pulls itself toward the shaft so it's not sticking out really far. Like uh, when I first put it on, it, I tried to 
tighten it as much as possible, but I can't pull it too tight because it pulls too much on this sinew wrapping, okay? So it'll pull itself out if I pull this too tight to to get it to sit, you know, close to the shaft. So uh, when, it, when the feathers are wet, they're expanded, and then after I finish wrapping, they shrink down and they get closer and tighter to the shaft. Okay, and then I come back and I trim with scissors. So I trim quite a bit off. Okay. Now even with a lot trimmed off, there are still some in the book that have shorter fletchings than this, but I like this length here. It looks pretty good. Okay, and the last step is to just coat everything with duck fat. And I just get some on my finger and then, you know, coat everything all the way down to the uh, this wrapping here. I don't put duck fat or any kind of oil down in this area and especially not here at the knot because I want to be able to grip it here. Now some of these are painted in here in different uh, locations on the uh, shaftment. I, I didn't paint this one and uh, looking in the book not many were painted in this area on the eastern uh, style arrows. Most of them were painted up here near the near the tip. Now these markings are at exactly 28 inches from the knock. It started at 28 inches right there. So everything else sticks out from the bow. And I was working on the, the tips and I finished these. I put a little more sinew on here uh, in a crisscross fashion. I, uh, I cut some of this off to make it shorter and then I, I roughed, roughed this up here so it would fit snugly and, and not move around. Okay. Now the weight on this See if I can get it level here. Let's see. It says 98, but it was saying 92 earlier. Let's see if I can get this to work. Anyway, there it goes, 92, and I made a bone arrow head also for this arrow, 92. So they're both 92 grains, quite a difference in size. This is bone. A cow bone. Now, I was going to make one out of antler, and I think antler is slightly heavier than bone. But it gives you an idea of the difference. Okay. And this fits in snugly as well. And of course it can be shot without anything, just blunt like this, but for more uh, more damaging shots, you can add the uh, bone or the stone arrowhead. Okay, and the next, the other arrow, the next one after this is going to be a fishing arrow, uh, basically the same design except with a fishing tip. Okay, but for now this arrow is, is finished. Uh, I also have a burnisher I didn't mention. Uh, I have some of these made out of, out of antler, but on this particular arrow I use the, uh, the bone burnisher. 
I have a couple burnishers in a different box and I can't locate that box right now, so <laughs> I just use a piece of cow bone. All right, so I burnish it all the way down. Wherever I put the uh, the duck fat, it got burnished. Now there is one spot on the shaft that has some wild grain right there. See how it kind of goes up and down? I probably should have tried to follow that one spot and um, bent it straight, but it was just kind of difficult to follow, so I just... I just sanded through it. It still looks pretty sound. On this side the grain doesn't leave the uh, arrow. On this side it looks like some of the grain is leaving but should be alright. It's for display anyway but I like to make I like to make it as functional as possible. And it looks pretty straight. After about three days of straightening, it stays pretty straight. And then I coat it with the, uh, the duck fat and burnish it. Okay.